good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, the Vivacity Membership Webinar. Let's see how I go. The video camera may slow down, so we might have to um, uh, turn that off soon. So anyway, today's webinar is on standards 2.3, 2.4, and 8.3, uh, which is all around third-party arrangements. So with these standards, we'll be going through what are third-party arrangements, what do you need to have in place, um, and what are the relevant um, policies and procedures and documents that you need to refer to with regards to third parties. So this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement process under Standard 2.2. Following this webinar, you should hold a quality and compliance meeting and include in your minutes that you attended this webinar. You should re also review the policies and procedures for each of the standards that we'll be reviewing today, which is 2.3, uh, 2.4, and 8.4. Um, as per the policies and procedures for continuous improvement, you, you should undertake a review of the policies and procedures to ensure that your organisation is following the processes. You should also review any documentation relating to the standards uh, we have reviewed in this session today. Okay, so what does clauses 2.3, 2.4 and 8.3 mean to your RTO? So what it means is that all RTOs are responsible for managing their third parties. So if you do have any third party arrangements in place, you're responsible for monitoring those independent third parties and also reporting on any third party arrangements entered into or in, uh, concluding. So if you do not use other organisations to provide any RTO related services, you do not need to take any action relating to these requirements. But the thing is, a lot of people don't know, really understand who is a third party and what are the different requirements for those third parties. So today we're actually going to be reviewing what are those third party arrangements and um, understanding who you need to report to at ASPA and how you do that. So that's what we're going to be going through today. So as an RTO, you're responsible for all services delivered under your scope of registration, regardless of where it's conducted. And that includes if you are delivering training and assessment overseas. This responsibility applies to all of your obligations as an RTO, um, including providing data, uh, cooperating with ASPA, complying with advertising and marketing standards, informing prospective students, dealing with complaints and appeals, collecting fees and record keeping. Third party arrangements must be documented and transparent to assist you with managing the quality of your services. Uh, the, so with standards 2.3 to 2.4, these standards state that the RTO ensures that where services are provided on its behalf by a third party, the provision of those services is the subject of any written agreement. The RTO has sufficient strategies and resources to systematically monitor any services delivered on its behalf and uses these to ensure that services delivered comply with the standards at all times. So what is a third party arrangement? So a third party arrangement, as it's stipulated within the standards, is where any party that provides services on the behalf of your RTO is in an agreement with your organisation as a third party. This definition does not include a contract of employment between an RTO and an employee. Services means training, assessment, rehab, educational and support services and all activities related to the recruitment of prospective students. And uh, does not include services such as student counselling, mediation or information and communications technology and ICT support. So educational support services includes, sorry, we've got phones going off and I need to stop them from making noises. Okay, all right. Uh, support services may include pre-enrollment materials. So things that you provide to uh, organisations prior to like course commencement or things like that. Um, study support and study skills programs, language literacy and numeracy programs or referrals to these programs equipment resources and or programs to increase access to learners with disabilities and other learners, uh, learning resource centres, 
flexible scheduling and delivery of training and assessment. Learning materials in alternative formats, for example, in large print, uh, learning and assessment programs contextualised to the workplace and any other services that the RTO considers necessary to support learners to achieve competency. These support services are not considered as third party. So if you have these services, you don't need to report any of those um, if you're utilising any of those. So that's assessment tools. You don't need to report a third party with that. You don't need to report any third party for LNN assessments. If you've got a third party outside of your organisation who's conducting LNN assessment, that's not um, considered a third party in relation to these standards. So who are third parties? An RTO may be involved in third party arrangements with another RTO, with non-registered training providers. It could be with the recruitment agents or brokers, so people who are recruiting students for the, on behalf of the RTO. Employment job service agencies, marketing companies for the purpose of recruiting students on your behalf, and government appointed intermediaries. So we're going to go into this a bit further. So a third party arrangements with another RTO could include that you have a partnership with an RTO where they're also an RTO, but they don't have the qualifications or the units of competencies that you have on your scope. Or it might be that they do have the qualifications and units of competencies on their scope, but you want to access their government funding. So this type of arrangements was sometimes previously referred to as a partnership or auspicing arrangement with, an, with another RTO. So it's basically they're an RTO already um, and they may or may not have the qualifications or training products on that scope that you have on your scope. So an example of this is you could be partnering with an RTO that is delivering a qualification. So here's an example here of Certificate 3 in Fitness, which requires the delivery of first aid. So as a, as a core unit, so ABC Training decides to engage a third party RTO, Uptown Training, to deliver the first aid unit to its um, Certificate 3 in Fitness students. So that is a third party arrangement because you're engaging another RTO to come into your organisation and deliver a unit of competency, or it could be a whole qualification. So this can be sometimes the case with, uh, you might be delivering aged care, or childcare qualifications, where you get another RTO to come into your RTO and deliver first aid on your site. You could have an arrangement where you require your students to go get the first aid certificate independently, and then it's not part of the qualification that you are offering. In a lot of cases, particularly when it's a core, um, it is recommended that you should bring someone in to deliver the training on your site with your students. Uh, I used to do this all the time when I had uh, aged care and childcare. I would get a third party to come in and deliver the first aid units on my site uh, with the organisation. So although Uptown Training undertakes the training and assessment, it is ABC Training that would record the outcome for the unit and issue the record of results and test them accordingly. So the RTO that is delivering the training and assessment for the first aid unit would be responsible for issuing the certificate for the first aid unit and then what the lead RTO, so the RTOs, ABC training, for example, what they would do is they would then do a credit transfer from the unit of competency that where they got the other RTO to come in and deliver the single unit of competency. So that's a third. That's an example of third party arrangement that you may have with another RTO. Another example of that, it could be a few units that you don't have on your scope. It could be that you're putting a skill set together. Um, I'll give you an example that I have. Uh, I was working with, uh, when I had my RTO, I was working with a childcare RTO where we developed our the very first teacher's aid course. So there actually wasn't, there's now a, a qualification out there, uh, Certificate 3 in Education Support. That wasn't out there at that stage. There was no qualification in this area, but we had identified a need where there was a need for training for teacher's aides. So I auspiced or had a partnership arrangement with this other RTO where they delivered childcare units and I delivered business units. And we had a written agreement in place uh, between the two. So and what the arrangement we had is I delivered the business units, then provided a statement of attainment, and then those students went to the other RTO um, and got a statement of attainment for the units that they had on their scope of registration. 
it wasn't part of a full qualification back then. It was just two statements of attainments that they received, one that had the childcare units on it and the other that had the business units on it. So that's another example of where we had, where you could have a third party arrangement. It could be another example that I gave you a bit earlier is it could be that you partner with an RTO that has the same qualification as you on your scope, but you don't have any government funding and they do have access to government funding. So it could be that you have a third party arrangement with that other RTO where you uh, deliver and assess training for some of the units and they deliver and assess other units or the full qualification and you're working under their scope of registration. So you've got a third party arrangement with them uh, where they issue the certificate because they've got the government funding and they've got the uh, qualification on their scope as well. But you're able to assess some of the units or all of the units because you have them as part of your um, on your scope of registration. So that's just another example of where you might have a third party arrangement with another RTO. So there's also third party arrangements with non-registered training organisations that you could uh, have a partnership with. So this is where an RTO, so this would be you, may engage another organisation that is not an RTO, so they're not registered with ASPA or any other regulatory body, in order to provide specific training and assessments to its learners on its behalf. So for example, an RTO, Deaf Training, delivers Certificate 3 in aged care. Deaf Training decides to engage the Autumn of Our Lives aged care facility to deliver learning and assessment which has been contextualised to the workplace. So it's where they're delivering the training and assessment, they're, they've got trainers who hold the relevant qualifications, so they hold Certificate 4 in training and assessment, as well as hold the minimum of Certificate 3 in aged care. Um, and it's not even aged care anymore, this is an old one, so it's um, actually individual support now. So they hold the qualification in individual support, um, but they don't have any, uh, they're not an RTO, so they don't have any qualifications. So those trainers and assessors would uh, work under the scope of registration of that RTO, and the RTO's responsibility would be to ensure that those trainers and assessors hold the relevant qualifications, they have a staff matrix for that trainer assessor, and they also have uh, copies of all of the relevant qualifications that that trainer and assessor holds. So they have that in place um, with working with that um, third party arrangement with a non-registered training provider. Another example of this uh, non-registered -tra training providers could be, um, and there's a lot of these out there, where you might be an RTO that has first aid units on your scope of registration and you have third parties who deliver under your scope of registration. So they want to deliver, and this is just one example, so they deliver uh, training and assessment and they recruit students on their own behalf. Uh, they're responsible for coordinating all the resources. Um, they're responsible for working with the RTO in order to do this. Um, they're responsible for ensuring that the trainers and assessors hold the relevant qualifications, have a staff matrix, have, and that the RTO has all of the qualifications on file uh, within the RTO. Um, they, uh, so that third party arrangement is where you have a non-registered training provider delivering under the scope of registration of an RTO. Now we see this a lot, uh, this comes up uh, quite regularly. Uh, we often get people who are currently working under partnership with another RTO who decide that they're now uh, got sufficient amount of work to be able to set themselves up as an RTO now. You may be one of those um, people who are doing that. So uh, it's, a, it's a very common uh, setup. Uh, there's a lot of people who work under partnership, start with a partnership and then identify that um, they're now in a situation where they now need to become an RTO. So that's a third party arrangement with a non-registered training provider. Okay, so the next one is a third party arrangement with student recruitment agents or brokers. So this could be you're either a CRIPOS provider or you might be an RTO that recruits, engages a company that recruits students on your behalf. So you may engage an individual or party to recruit students. For example, a third party organisation could be Skills Today. It advertises Certificate 4 in Hospitality on its website on behalf of ABC Training. So as part of this third party arrangement, Skills Today collects enrolment information on behalf of ABC's training. 
um, skills today subsequently provides the students with enrolments to ABC training. So it could be uh, a company where you're advertising your courses on their website. Uh, and what they do is this organisation recruits the students on your behalf and then forward them to your RTO. Now, the reason why you need to have a third party agreement in place for these types of organisations is to ensure that they're actually collecting, uh, they're advertising correctly, um, they're meeting the requirements of the standards, so they're complying with the requirements of the standards, and that you are informed throughout the whole process of what those um, uh, standards are and what, what they uh, are to comply with. So this is a, a considered a third party arrangement, whether or not a commission is paid or not uh, to that third party. So for this example is skills today. So um, it could be that you pay a commission for them to recruit students on your behalf uh, for every student that they bring in, or it could be that it's a free um, advertising platform. The reason, as I stated before, the reason why you need to have an agreement, a written agreement in place, is because you need to, um, they need to understand that they're also required to comply with the standards. And that's what should be in your written agreement, is those requirements. So another example is an employment service provider. So an RTO might provide training for clients of an employment service provider. Um, and th these are um, organisations like job network providers or, um, uh, organisations that are helping long-term unemployed find work, so it might be disability uh, service providers as well. So an organisation that helps finds jobs for individuals seeking employment. In order to source employment for its clients and provide skilled workers to employers, an employment service provider may source training from one or more RTOs in order to upskill their clients. So generally these are job network providers, also known as JSAs, so job service authorities, uh, and thereby where the, they're recruiting students, um, their clients of theirs, and then they're going through a range of RTOs where they will deliver training and assessment. So you need to have a written agreement in place with them as well that includes what are the responsibilities of each party. So an example of this is an employment service provider, for example, top skills employment, has an agreement in place with an RTO, ABC Training, which specifies that top skills employment may utilise ABC Training for training and assessment to be provided to its clients. ABC Training may or may not provide a fee to top skills employment in exchange for the enrolment of the top skills clients into a training product delivered by ABC Training. So it doesn't matter whether you're getting paid or not for that agreement. Uh, you ne still need to have a written agreement in place to ensure that everyone's complying with the standards for RTOs. Now this one's uh, unique and a bit different and not everyone would be in this situation. But this is government appointed intermediaries. So a government appointment intermediary refers to clients to various programs, including to training providers by R provided by RTOs. So government appointed intermediaries do not recruit students on behalf of specific RTOs, but rather fulfill their obligations in relation to their clients on behalf of government departments. So these intermediaries do not receive funding from a government department, RTOs or prospective students in exchange for referrals. So an example of this is a government appointed intermediary could be Q Training Centre. It has an arrangement in place with a government department to provide programs to unemployed youth, which may include a training component. Q Training Centre refers its clients to one or more government contracted RTOs in order to provide training to its clients. So an example of government appointed intermediaries include Australian Apprenticeship Centres, the Disability Services Commissions, Departments of the Correctional Services, some employment service providers and migrant resource centres. So if you do have these arrangements in place, you need to ensure that you have a written agreement in place that meets the requirements of the standards and that you are monitoring these third party arrangements with these other parties. So, how, so however, in some cases, these government appointment in intermediaries may be providing other services or referring other prospective students on behalf of the RTO. These cases are considered third party arrangements and are therefore subject to the relevant standards. So what do these clauses mean to you? 
the RRTO is responsible for services delivered under its registration. So regardless of where they are conducted, including in other countries. This responsibility applies to all your obligations as an RTO. So this is every standard clause within the standards for RTOs. So this includes providing data to the regulatory body, cooperating with the regulatory body, complying with advertising and marketing standards, informing prospective students, dealing with complaints and appeals, collecting fees and record keeping. So with all of these requirements, you need to ensure that you have an agreement in place with these third parties and that you are, as the RTO, are responsible for the collection of all of this data. And you need to make it clear in your third party agreement what the third party is responsible for. Ultimately, it's always the RTO that is responsible. So you need to make sure that you have sufficient arrangements in place to monitor those third parties. So the RTO must have a written agreement with any third party or partner, which clearly identifies the responsibilities of each partner. The agreement must clearly outline monitoring arrangements that the RTO will conduct to ensure compliance. And these include clear guidelines to the partner or third party on how to comply with the requirements of the VET quality framework. When it comes to the recruitment of students, there are clear guidelines on the recruitment and enrolment process within your policies and procedures and within your agreement, your written agreement with that third party. And this includes any LNN or pre-enrollment requirements that you have for those students. The agreement should include that the CEO of the RTO is responsible for approving all marketing before it is made publicly available. So you need to ensure that all of your agreements include the responsibilities of both the RTO and the third party. It should also include that the third party is responsible for cooperating with ASQA in the provision of the information and in the conduct of audits. So as a third party, you, your partner, third party, party um, partners may also be required to attend an audit or you may, they may be required to have an ASQA audit at their site because you need to declare all to ASQA who are all of your third parties. These are mainly going to be for third parties that are delivering training and assessment under your scope of registration. But it could also be for third parties who are conducting marketing on your behalf. The RTO is responsible for issuing qualifications and statements of attainment and that the third party cannot issue on behalf of the RTO. Now I've seen this on a number of occasions where the third party was issuing the certificate. You can't do that. The third party is not an RTO. Only RTOs can issue certificates. So you need to ensure that it's clear that these third parties cannot issue certificates. So the written agreements for your training and assessment services should include um, and include that on behalf of, might include the name of your RTO and the third party, the start and the end date of the agreement. So generally people will run them for 12 months. You could do longer, you could do two, three years, it's up to you. There's no restrictions around how long the agreement needs to be in place. Details of the RTO's operations, including all delivery locations in Australia or elsewhere. Clauses detailing your RTO's obligations under the agreement, for example, setting out which party will issue qualifications and statements to So as I stated earlier, it's only the RTO that can issue, but this arrangement may be where the both you may both be RTOs and you both have the scope of the qualifications on your scope of registration. Which party will provide pre-enrolment information and which party will collect learner fees and enrolment information. So clauses detailing the obligations of the third party, for example, setting out which party will provide the training and assessment materials, resources and facilities. It is always the RTO's responsibility to ensure that all of the resources and assessment tools that are um, utilised in the conduct of assessment has a copy of those assessment tools and in particular completed assessment tools um, uh, kept at their site, at their head office. There needs to also be included in the third party agreement, 
the mechanisms through which the RTO will systematically monitor the third party. So if the third party is providing the training and assessment materials, resources and facilities and developing marketing initiatives, uh, this should be set out. How will you as the RTO review these prior to use for all delivery sites? And how you will ensure that trainers and assessors provided by the third party will meet the requirements of the standards. Record keeping procedures for student enrolment and information and completed student assessments should also be included. Clauses related to which uh, party will validate completed student assessments um, and any of your RTO's obligations or the third party's obligations related to VET fee help, government funded uh, subsidies, so I was talking about government funding that you may be working under partnership with another RTO or any other financial support. And clauses requiring the third party to cooperate with ASQA and provide accurate responses to requests about delivery of those services. Your written agreements with a third party providing recruitment service also on your behalf might include the name of the RTO and the third party, the start and end date of the agreement, clauses detailing your obligations under the agreement. For example, you might stipulate that your RTO will review all marketing initiatives, provide current and accurate pre-enrolment information, and ensure that all information provided to a learner meets the materials, meets the requirements specified in clauses 4.1, 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4 of the standards. You might stipulate that the RTO will ensure that all materials in languages other than English will be translated by the RTO to ensure it meets the requirements. Clauses detailing the obligations of the third party, for example, you might want to stipulate that the third party will provide your RTO with all the marketing material before publishing, provide learner enrolment information and learner fees to the RTO, and train the third party's uh, staff to be able to assist with the training package and enrolment requirements. So it needs to be clear within your written agreement if you're using a recruitment service, so this is someone who's recruiting students on your behalf, um, you need to make it clear what is the approval requirements for your marketing and all of the information that is provided to the students prior to course commencement. You should include clauses detailing the obligations of the third party. For example, you might want to stipulate um, the third party will provide your, your RTO with all marketing material before publishing. So it's really clear that the marketing material is reviewed by the RTO because you're the one that is responsible for the marketing material. And this includes what goes onto their website. So uh, uh, there's been numerous times where I've gone to, actually it's in, more in situations where we're working with someone who's currently working under a third party arrangement, who is now preparing to be an RTO. And it's not clear on their website who is the RTO. Um, and it's got no, uh, nothing on the website that actually states the RTO ID or the name of the RTO that is responsible for the compliance. If you're working under partnership with another RTO, it should be clear on your website who is issuing the certificate and who has the qualifications or the units of competencies on their scope of registration. So any of your RTO's obligations or the third party's obligations, including what relates to government funding and VET fee help and any other financial support. You should also include details of arrangements for commissions or fees to be retained by the third party. So this is where they're marketing on your behalf. Um, the mechanisms through which your RTO will systematically monitor the third party and clauses requiring the third party to cooperate with ASPA and to provide accurate responses to requests uh, about provisions of services. You must have a written agreement with any third party that delivers services under the RTO's registration, including services such as training and assessment, providing educational and support services, or through the recruitment of prospective students. The requirement for a written agreement does not apply when you hire trainers and assessors, they're contractors. So you are contracting them to deliver training and assessment on your scope of registration. So this is trainers and assessors who are not responsible for advertising or marketing or recruitment of the students. They are contractors to your organisation. You contract them to work within a certain period. So it might be three days a week from 9am to 3pm 
where they're delivering training at your premises or at a premises that is where you have hired the premises um, and they're delivering that training assessment under your scope of registration. That's a contract, that's not a third party arrangement. Where you make arrangements for advertising for your services. So this includes, um, so it's not where someone's recruiting students on your behalf, so they're responsible for getting all the students in place. This is where you're just doing an ad. So you're doing an ad maybe on someone else's website or you're doing it in a magazine or you're doing it through someone's email um, subscription services. You don't need to have a written agreement, although I do recommend you still have a written agreement in place with those parties, um, but it doesn't apply in this situation because they're not recruiting students on your behalf um, and you need to, you're responsible for those advertisements that go on to those other sites. You don't need a third party arrangement uh, agreement in place for any workplace supervisor who contributes to evidence collection, collected uh, during the training. So I've got a question, what about if I do the training, does there have to be a written agreement for me? So is this as the RTO owner, Juliet, or as, so in that situation, anybody as the principal, no, you don't need a written agreement. Um, so you're, any employee of the RTO does not need to have a written agreement if they're delivering training as an employee of the RTO. So it, you don't need it for employees of the RTO or contractors of the RTO who are delivering training and assessment on behalf of the RTO. Okay, now on to clause 2.4. So the RTO has sufficient strategies and resources to systematically monitor any services delivered on its behalf. So how are you going to ensure that you're monitoring these third party arrangements? So your monitoring strategy should include um, your strategies on how you're gonna monitor. So things like timeframes for monitoring, when are you gonna do it? How often is it gonna be monthly, weekly, yearly? I'd recommend more than yearly. Um, depending on how often they're delivering training and assessment, it might be that they only deliver two sessions a year. So you might want to monitor each time that they uh, return assessments to your RTO. Um, but you need to have this formalised in your written agreement. So procedures for how you will monitor. So how will you conduct a review and how will the outcomes of the review be acted upon? Will you be completing an opportunity for improvement? Um, will it be monitored at your monthly meetings? These are what we have in our policies and procedures that you should be doing. How will you monitor student assessments, pre-enrolment information is given to the students, training and assessment resources, facilities and equipment, uh, trainer assessor competencies and qualifications, marketing and advertising information, issuance of qualifications, statements of attainment and records management practices. So how will you implement strategies for two-way feedback between your RTO and the third party? What are you, how are you going to communicate? Is it going to be through a Skype meeting? Are you going to meet face to face once a year and then every other time is going to be through a Skype meeting? Um, are you going to communicate via email? So it needs to be clear in your policies and procedures how you're going to monitor, but also um, uh, in your written agreement, how you're going to manage that as well. So it's third party uh, trainers. So Although the, your trainers must also comply, um, so do your third party trainers must comply with the standards for 1.13 to 1.16. So the third party trainers and assessors are also responsible for ensuring that they undertake uh, professional development in both the vet and the vocational sectors where they're going to be delivering training and assessment. They also must hold the current qualifications in both vet and their vocational area. So the current one is um, TAE 40116, which is Certificate 4 in Training and Assessment, and then they are also must hold the qualification in which they are delivering training and assessment under. They are also responsible for maintaining their currency within their industry. So how are they demonstrating that they're maintaining their currency? And this should be clear in your written agreement, how you're going to do that, and how are you going to monitor the trainers and assessors under the third party arrangement? Standard 8.3 is all about notifying ASQA of those third party arrangements. So you need to ensure that they're notified of any written agreement entered into under clause 2.3 for the delivery of services on its behalf within 30 calendar days of that agreement being entered into 
or prior to the obligations under the agreement taking effect, whichever occurs first. And within 30 calendar days of the agreement coming to an end. So you need to notify ASPA of both of those. So how do you notify ASPA? Um, ASPA has made a change. You were, last year, you were to notify ASPA of any third party arrangements through ASPANET. So you'd log into ASPANET and you could submit a notification to ASPA through um, the, uh, through ASPANET. So you could do that through there. So what I'm going to be doing now, this is the new way and this is the website where you go to. So to notify ASPA of a third party arrangement, you need, now need to go to this um, website. Now, how do you find it when you're not requiring it straight away you can go onto the ASPA website and they can um, it's in there as well uh, how to notify ASPA of third party arrangements I'm assuming it's going to be back in under ASPANET eventually I don't understand why this form is not within ASPANET um, it seems a bit strange to me um, but this is the uh, where you can access it so ASPONET no longer provides those facilities. So there is no cost associated with submitting the notification form. ASPA will process the form and send you an email confirming that your RTO's details have been updated with the third party agreement um, connected with your RTO. It is an explicit requirement of all RTOs under the standards for RTOs to notify ASPA within 30 calendar days of entering a written agreement with another organisation for the delivery of the services, including training and assessment, related educational and support services, and or any uh, activities related to the recruitment of prospective students on behalf of your RTO. So I'm now going to show you a what this form looks like. So I'm going, so that's the link that I've just sent you. I'm now going to go to um, the third party portal where you can notify uh, 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 ASPA of those third party arrangements. So this is the form here, so third party service arrangement notification. So the name of the RTO or legal entity, that's you, so you should put in here your, the name of your RTO. So if we were to do uh, this example that we've been using today, so it'd be ABC for Fridge Limited. Um, and then in here, you put any trading name. So if you do, do, did have a trading name, if you don't have a trading name, you don't need to put it in there. You then also need to put your RTO ID. So you put your RTO code in there um, that is related to your RTO. You should put the email address. I would use a generic email address that you would have for your RTO um, that you would use for notifications of to ASPA. Uh, we have a generic email address that we use, uh, which is also a distribution email distribution list uh, where we notify ASPA of, um, of any changes, but it's also what we use for distribution lists. Um, anyway, this is an example of an email address that you could use, the RTO app, whatever your RTO name is. So you then put in here the type of legal entity that you um, that you are for change of details if any of your RTO details have changed you need to complete a notification of material change of event so uh, generally most RTOs are going to be a proprietary limited um, this is where I find it quite strange that this is not in the ASQANET portal because all of this would be populated automatically and you wouldn't need to enter it um, if you're within ASQANET so I don't understand why uh, this is not in there Notification details. So you would hear either the commencement or the cessation of a service agreement. If you never notified ASPA of a commencement of an agreement, I don't know whether it's a good idea for you to then notify them of a cessation if you never actually notified them of a commencement. Um, so you should always be notifying, and this has been a requirement for quite a while, um, of any third party agreements that you have in place and you need to notify ASPA of those. If you have any third party agreements like the ones that I've outlined today in today's webinar, it might be a good idea for you to get online right now, use this link and actually notify ASPA of these third party arrangements. So the date of the commencement of or first reporting of an existing service agreement or anticipated or actual cessation of a service agreement. 
So you could state today, or it's going to commence tomorrow maybe, um, an agreement that's going to commence. So there's an agreement there. Now this is where you put the third party um, details. So this uh, would go in here. So we can have XYZ training, propriety limited. Um, they might have uh, super training here is the trading name. Is the third party an ABN? So if yes, so where they wouldn't be an ABN, it might be a someone who's working under a third party arrangement who isn't earning over $75,000 a year who are going to be recruiting students on your behalf and don't have an ABN. So that's where they may not have an ABN. In most cases, they would have an ABN. So here, you would then put their ABN. You put that in there. And then if they have a, uh, an ACN, you should also put that in here. If the third party was another RTO, you would put their RTO code in this section here. But if they're not an RTO, you wouldn't put anything there. Um, and who is the contact person? Um, so you'd put all the details of the contact person, what their number might be. You'll put that in here. Um, if their number is the same, so I've got just the mobile, um, you could put both their numbers in here. Um, and then you'd put their email address in here. Uh, have it in there. Um, and what is the services that they're providing on behalf? So this third party arrangement may be someone who's delivering training assessment under your scope. Um, they might be recruiting uh, respective learners, enrollment of learners, including fee uh, receipting. So they might be enrolling students on your behalf. They might be providing educational support services. So it might be counseling services or support services where they're looking after your students on your behalf. Um, they're actually delivering, so this example I was using is they're actually delivering training and assessment under your scope of registration. This is the most common third party arrangement. Unless you are a Tricost provider, you might be um, engaging the services of an agency where they're recruiting students uh, or prospective students on your behalf. So you would also tick that box. Um, there shouldn't be an issuance of certificates unless they're issuing certificates. So it might be that you have a third party arrangement with another RTO that is issuing certificates on your behalf. So for example, that first aid unit for the full qualification. So that's where they would have, they're responsible for the issuance of the certificate. So in reality, if you're both RTOs, you would both be notifying ASPRA of those third party arrangements and linking those two RTOs together one would be that they're issuing certificates on your behalf. Um, the other would be that they're delivering training and assessment on your behalf. So um, you'd be notifying those. Include services to overseas students. So if you are delivering services to overseas students and you've got someone recruiting um, on your behalf overseas, so you would have a yes there. And then the CEO signs a declaration. So there's actually a uh, declaration that they would download. So you would fill in this uh, declaration, fill that in, sign it, scan it, and then upload it. And then you would upload it to here and then submit this form. So I've got a question. Hi, Angela, I need clarification on one point. Our trainer assessor is contracted by us, i.e. she is not an employee and she is not another RTO. We do have a written agreement with her. Do we still need to advise ASPRA as per the form you are showing us now? Is this trainer assessor also recruiting students on your behalf? Are they setting up the delivery site where they're delivering training? Are they also responsible for any marketing materials that where they're advertising on your behalf? If it's a no, then no, you don't need to notify ASPA. It's only where they're recruiting students on your behalf, so as a trainer assessor. So that would be an auspicing or a partnering arrangement where they're delivering training and assessment under your scope of registration. So it's only in those situations that you'd need to notify ASPA. 
So if you are contracting a trainer where they're also recruiting students on your behalf, then yes, you would need to notify ASPA of that third party arrangement. So the reason behind that is ensuring that ASPA know that you have an agreement, a written agreement in place where you're monitoring those students on behalf of your RTO, basically, because as an RTO, you're responsible for the compliance requirements of ensuring that those third parties are um, uh, working within the standards and within your policies and procedures. So that's why that's why it's important is that you're doing that um, and ensuring that they um, ha you have a third party arrangement in place uh, that you that they understand that third party understands what their responsibilities are as an RTO to deliver training and assessment under that your scope of registration. And that in that third party arrangement, you include um, what, what, who's responsible for what? Who's gonna be responsible for making sure training and assessment is in place? How is the training and assessment conducted? How are they going to ensure that um, who's collecting the enrollment form? who's entering the data from that enrollment form onto uh, the database, whose database is it. Um, all, um, all student details should be maintained by the RTO that's responsible with the scope, with the scope of registration. So it just needs to be clear you, you, at all times as the RTO, you are responsible for ensuring that the students um, uh, ensuring that you are responsible against the standards for RTOs. So you have everything in place. You're maintaining the student files. You're maintaining the trainer assessor files. You're ensuring that all the marketing complies with the standard standard 4.1, um, that you are ensuring that you're conducting assessment validation, and that includes post-assessment validation of the assessment tools that that third party is collecting evidence for um, against those units of competencies or the qualification that you are working on the third party arrangement. So you need to make sure it's clear under your third party arrangement who's responsible for what um, in that third party arrangement. So uh, and in the end, it's just ensuring that um, you are collecting sufficient evidence that demonstrates that the RTO is compliant um, against all the standards at all times. Um, third party arrangements can be quite risky um, as an RTO, particularly if you're not monitoring those third party arrangements. You need to ensure that you're monitoring those third party arrangements um, and ensuring that you're complying with the standards at all times. Um, so that's what's really important with those areas. Um, I'd be interested to see if anybody is interested to um, put it in the chat box there. Has anybody got any third party arrangements in place at the moment that met all those requirements um, that I had in there for um, what is a third party arrangement? So I'm just gonna go back to that list of what is a third party arrangement. That's these ones here. So do you have an agreement with another RTO? Do you have an agreement where someone um, who's not an RTO is delivering training and assessment under your scope of registration? Do you use recruitment agents or brokers um, that uh, who would recruit students on your behalf? Um, do you have employment or job services? Do you work with job network providers where you provide training and assessment for those job network providers? Um, do you engage a recruitment company to recruit students on your behalf? Um, are there, is there anybody that's marketing um, on your behalf for the purpose of recruiting students? Um, and it's very rare that you'd have the government um, appointed intermediaries. It doesn't, no one's answering, so I'm assuming no one who's online at the moment has any agreements in place. I do have a question. May we get a copy of your PowerPoint? Everybody who is a member gets a copy of the recording of the webinar. 
So you'll get a copy of the recording of the webinar um, and you can share that with anybody on your team. So you can all get a copy of that. So um, you'll be able to share that and actually get a better understanding of what those requirements are. Now, um, we do have policies and procedures included with our um, within our QNC manual. So the QNC manual for RTOs in there is a whole heap of arrangements with monitoring uh, third party arrangements um, and, and agreements and what should be in your third party agreements. Um, if you are a CRICOS provider um, with the CRICOS membership package, we also include monitoring uh, third party arrangements with education agents and migration agents. So we have that all in there as well. Sorry, just skipping a bit. Um, so, um, but what we're doing at the moment, um, Amanda is currently reviewing all of our third party arrangements. Um, we've identified that the third party monitoring arrangements that we wrote for CRICOS is actually really relevant for what we did, uh, what we do need to do for RTOs. And a lot of the documentation that we have for that, we're actually going to adjust them and we're actually going to have some written agreements in place for RTOs as well for third party. So if you're thinking about having a third party arrangement, um, we're going to have all of those documents um, within the next, uh, say, two to three months. Um, we'll have those and they'll be on Unicorn. Um, where you'll be able to access all of those documents as well for monitoring third party arrangements as well. So that includes for education migration agents, um, but also if you're having an auspice agreement with another RTO or if you've got someone delivering training and assessment under your scope of registration, um, we're going to have a few more documents uh, available on Unicorn that you'll be able to access uh, for monitoring those third party arrangements. On that note, or also like to um, uh, advise that ASCA or not ASCA, COAG are currently reviewing the standards for RTOs and that it is anticipated that there's going to be new standards released before the end of this year. So we will be busy rewriting all of our policies, procedures, forms and documentation against the new requirements for the standards for RTOs. Um, what we anticipate are going to be those changes will be they've now got the new audit model and you may have already seen, if you go onto um, the ASPA uh, website, you poor things, so I just said, that's our job, that's what we do. <laughs> um, it keeps us um, occupied, that's for sure, uh, whenever the government changes the standards. And that's why you do membership, because you don't have to do it, we do it. We review all of the policies, procedures, forms and documentation against the new standards requirements. So um, it means that you can focus on what you do, which is keeping, uh, getting students and then looking after those students. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen with you as well uh, and go back to where these new, where the standards are. So this, this is a user's guide to the standards for RTOs 2015. Um, you'll see now that they've been rewritten. This I'm on the ASCO website here. Um, they've been rewritten to, they've now got chapters, like chapter one is marketing and recruitment, chapter two is enrollment, chapter three is support progression, chapter four is training assessment. So all of the standards are now um, in student journey. So they've actually put them in order of the student journey and this is how they're auditing RTOs now as well. So marketing and recruitment is, even though it's chapter one, is clause 4.1 um, and then enrollment has a few standards underneath them. So even though it's chapter two, it's actually clauses 5.1 to 5.3, clause 7.3 and clause 3.5. So they've actually got um, changed it quite a bit. So what we're anticipating, one of the changes is going to be that the standards will now be in the same order as the how they're doing these now. So the chapters um, and they're going to, uh, have in place now that the new standards will be in the order of the student journey. So it will be from when the student commences uh, through to recruitment, uh, through to, so, so it's going to be marketing material, your recruitment process, how you're going to enrol them, then how you're managing and monitoring their training and assessment, 
um, right through to certificate reissue. So how you issuing certificates and reissues of those certificates. Um, that will be uh, one of the changes that are happening. The other thing that's going to be uh, changing with the standards is that the standards are, uh, there's a few standards clauses that are now redundant. So they're going to be removing the redundant clauses um, from the standards. So that's some of the changes that we're anticipating that will be coming. Um, and also they're making much more stringent requirements around new entrants um, into the training market. So as you may have seen in my blog that I released um, back in May, um, they've ASQA have made some major changes with initial registration requirements and that includes anybody who was registered within the last um, within the last uh, two years. So you'll also have those uh, requirements as well where uh, they will be changing standards in line with anybody who's registered within the last two years. You now need to, if once you go to audit, you'll need to do a self-assessment and you'll also be required to complete a financial viability assessment. Um, we're in the middle of rewriting our whole Kickstart uh, package to meet the requirements for um, self-assessment and financial viability. And we're also working with an accountant who will be doing that. So that includes anybody who's doing initial registration for RTO. And it can also be anybody who's an RTO who's then applying for CRICOS on their registration they'll need to meet these new requirements for initial registrations as well. So if you haven't read the blog, um, I highly recommend that you check it out um, because that blog um, has some interesting information. And this blog was based on an ASQA briefing and um, it was uh, actually what um, ASQA was stating are going to be the changes uh, for initial registration. So there's a link to my blog if you missed it. Um, the new uh, process for initial registration. So check it out because uh, it's going to affect anybody who was registered within the last two years. So that's from yesterday, 1st of July 2018. So it's going to affect you. So I recommend if you haven't read it uh, that you check out the blog. Um, and yeah, we're rewriting all of our Kickstart package, uh, which is going to give us a good idea of what's going to be happening with the standards as well. So we'll have... Um, uh, changes will start be starting to change our policies and procedures against these new requirements as well, particularly with self assessment and how are you going to manage your self assessment. And it's basically conducting uh, a systems check or an internal audit on an annual basis um, that you'll be required to do that as well. Okay, so that's the end of today's webinar. Um, if you have any further questions, you can post them and I can answer them for you now. Um, other than that, our next webinar will be on the first Monday in August. So I think it was the 6th of August is the next webinar. So you can um, uh, access that and I'll see you at the next webinar. Now, the next webinar will be on standards 3.1, 3.2, 3.3 and 3.4, um, which is round financial uh, viability and refund policies and procedures so around all of those areas. So thank you very much for attending today's webinar. I look forward to catching up with you at the next webinar in August. So have a great month. I look forward to catching up with you then. Thanks. Bye.